Hey, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. We're super excited to celebrate Christmas with you. Hey, can I tell you a little preacher secret? Um, every end of November, early December, preachers start to get nervous if they have to preach on Christmas Eve because they know they have to preach essentially the same story they did last year and the year before, and the year before, and the year before in a fresh way. And sometimes that can be intimidating. There's so much good stuff in God's word. And when you feel a little bit confined to one section, you feel like, Lord, are we gonna have anything you know, good and fresh for these people this year? But I believe we do. If that's all right with you, if you can, if you can believe this morning that possibly uh, Jesus Christ himself wants to speak something specific and direct to us today. And so today, we're going to talk about the Christmas story, but we're going to talk about it from this perspective. What do you do when you don't understand God's timing in your life? What do we do when we don't understand God's timing in our lives? And we're going to go to a text that is a Christmas text, even though we don't often think about it like a Christmas text. It's Galatians 4.4, 4, and we're going to start this way, but when the time was right, Somebody say, when the time was right. When the time was right, God sent his son, and a woman gave birth to him when the time was right. What does that even mean? Well, I think most of us know that wise planning and wise timing have a lot to do with success. That's just true, right? Like, you can be a really strong quarterback. You can be a really fast quarterback, but if you don't throw the ball at the right time, um, you might wind up with a disaster on your hands. You can be a moderate comedian or you can be a great comedian and often the difference there is timing. You can be a pitcher that they'll pay 80 million dollars to per year or you can be a pitcher they won't pay you anything and the ball's not different, the distance isn't different, it's the timing that is different. There's all kinds of places where having the right timing is insanely important and when Timing isn't going right, we can get uncomfortable. Sometimes we can even get really anxious. We can get even maybe a little bit irritable. So um, this past spring, my wife and I went on our 20 year anniversary. We were headed down, yeah, come on, to Jamaica. And we get on the plane, you know, we're ready to go, man. Everything's all set, we've been thinking about it for months and months. And you get on the plane and we're about to, you know, about to take off and we're looking around, all right, let's go, you know? And, and five minutes goes by. 10 minutes goes by. And that's like 15 minutes going by. And we're like, what's going on? Why doesn't the plane go? Like, why don't we all just get where we're going? You know, you want to go knock on the captain's door and be like, what's up, man? Like, we're, we're ready. What, what about you? Why aren't we going yet? Because I had this expectation about one time, but now you're doing something else that is causing us to have to go at a different time. And of course, they're not going to tell me what they're doing. All I know is I have to wait kind of in the dark, so to speak, while we all wait to get where we're going. And we can be frustrated sometimes when what we wanted to happen isn't happening. And sometimes we can even get envious. Sometimes we can get spiritual ADD. And we can look at the different ones around us and be like, well, why do they get to have a baby now? Like, I wanted the baby. Why did they get that promotion? I wanted that promotion. I feel like I've been waiting forever. How come they get it? Man, they got married? Them? Are you serious? What about me? I've been waiting all this time, and then they get married. Timing can have a lot to do with our peace, can have a lot to do with our anxiety. And so we've got to get this right. What do we do when we don't understand God's timing in our lives? And is it random? I mean, is it all just random? Or is it possible that God is way more deliberate with what happens when in our lives and in the big picture of the universe than we have maybe considered before? So on Christmas Eve... We're going to ask the question, how do I trust God's timing in my life, even when it seems like things are going exactly the wrong direction? And we're going to learn from Mary and Joseph. I think you're going to find that we've got a little bit more in common with them than maybe you previously understood. So let's pick it up. We're going to pick up in Luke chapter 1, verse 29. Now, the angel Gabriel has just appeared to Mary. And that's a big deal. You know, she's like a young teenager. And so this big, powerful, glorious angel appearing with a special message just for her, like most of us, it's freaking her out, man. Like she's not like, oh, I expected you. She didn't expect him. And now he's bringing this news. Here's what he says. Verse, uh, verse 29, here's how she responds. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Do not be afraid, Mary. Somebody say, do not be afraid. 
Do not be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, if you ha- for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. Well, we're going to skip ahead a little bit in this story because it turns out Mary is pregnant, and she was betrothed to Joseph. And that, that takes a while, you know, in, in that time it took like a year to actually get married from the time that you say you're engaged to the time that you're married. You're, you're kind of understood as married, even though you haven't necessarily said the vows yet, but this time is going by and he knows that he's betrothed to her and now she's pregnant. He's like, dude, I know I didn't do it. And so he wants to protect her from having too much shame, but he also knows that he shouldn't marry this girl. And so he's contemplating all this and he has a dream. Listen to the dream. Verse 20, as he considered this, Matthew 1, verse 20, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. So they're both getting messages from God through these, these angels. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid. Somebody say, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So what do we have? We have two young people that are both kind of perturbed, kind of confused, kind of like blown away a little bit. And I, I like to think that at some point they had to get together and compare notes, right? Like, like they're, they're like, what, what did he tell you? Didn't he? Oh, Jesus too? Okay, well that makes me feel better. Whew. At least we both got the same name. I've, 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 I've been freaked out if people are like, wait a minute, you got Andrew? I got Jesus. I, I don't know, maybe this is right, you know? But at least they had the name, they got the name right. They both heard Jesus. But now they've got to think about what does this mean moving forward? They've probably got a little bit of social, you know, outcasthood because she was out of wedlock and it's just gonna sound like a silly story when people find this out. Well, Joseph, he had a dream from the angel. And you and I, we're not really gonna have the level of importance of dreams from God as Joseph and Mary did. You and I will never have an important enough mission where we're supposed to raise the son of God, okay? We're not gonna have that. But it's still true that there are things that God places in our hearts dreams and, and desires and things that we have some kind of an inkling. We don't even know. We wouldn't say this or God spoke to us, but there's something about it. It's baked into our personality. We're like, I know I'm supposed to do these things. I've got these kinds of gifts. I know I'm supposed to use them, or I care about these kinds of people. I know I'm supposed to help them. I know that I can go to medical school and help people in these kinds of ways. And, and there's just for some of us, there, there's this dream that we're like, I, I think I'm supposed to maybe do this but for many of us, time goes by, and, and, and that's, that's a little easier to think about when we're young. But as we get older, the world and the people of the world beat us up a little bit, and those dreams can go from broken to beat up to buried. And we can just let go of them entirely. We're like, ah, you know, it's too late for me. If, if something like that was going to happen, I think it would have happened by now. And we say, maybe there was a right time, but I guess I just missed it. Let's go to Luke chapter two. At that time, somebody say at that time. At that time, the Roman emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. It was about 70 miles. And he took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. While they were there, the time came. Mary and Joseph are in for some some tests, really. We kind of think, we look at them, we're like, I guess they were just fine with everything. I guess it was all going to be, you know, they just knew what was going to happen and it was going to be okay. But I really believe when the angels spoke to them, I think it was probably kind of easy, well, you are an angel, so I guess I'll believe that. That that sounds, I believe that what you say is going to happen. I don't know how, I don't know how it's going to work, but I believe that. But how many know there's a difference between, okay, I believe you to... I trust you. See, I trust you is a little bit different. It was when things were getting harder that now it's time to trust. I already believed him, but now I have to actually, I have to go through the things that I'm like, okay, I'm counting on you that yes, this is actually going to work out and be good even when it begins to be a little bit ouchy from time to time. So let's talk about some truths about time. Here's number one. God has a timetable for everything that happens. 
God has a timetable for everything that happens, even when it looks random to us. The Bible's pretty clear that God has a timetable for everything that happens. You look at Ecclesiastes chapter three, there's an entire chapter about this. God's like, I want you to know it's not as random as it looks. God has a timetable. God had a timetable for when Christmas would happen. And we might say, well, why did he pick then? It doesn't seem very obvious to me. Why did he not choose 2,000 years earlier? Why didn't he choose 38 years from now? Here's the answer. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know why he didn't wait another few centuries. We don't know because we're not God. It's not our timetable. And if we could understand everything, we would be God. How many know that God's ways are still mysterious? Even though through the grace of God, through Jesus Christ, we can know God, that doesn't mean he causes us to understand everything. God has a timetable for everything that happens. But here's number two, God does not tell us the details in advance. How many are learning this? Like God does not tell us the details in advance. People do all kinds of crazy things to try to understand the future. Like we clearly want to know the future. Did you know that America spends $2.2 billion per year on fortune tellers? You know, much, you know what I could do with the gospel for $2.2 billion? But that's, that's how bad people want to know about the future. But God says, sorry, I ain't telling. And, and, and it's not that we'll never know anything, but we might get little inklings of, hey, this might happen, or it might work this way, or I want you to walk in this general direction. But there's definitely not detailed reports that were handed, like this is what's going to happen. Nope, God does have a very detailed plan for our life, but he doesn't tell us about it. Why is that? Well, for one, um, we couldn't understand it if we tried. Okay, so just think about this. If you, if you could understand everything God understands, you would be God already. Like that would already be who you are. Listen to this scripture. It says in Ecclesiastes 3, 11, God has given them a desire to know the future. He does everything just right and on time, but people can never completely understand what he's doing. Why can't they understand it? Well, it's a little bit like my dog, Chesterton. Um, my dog, Chesterton, no matter what he does, is never going to be able to understand how the internet works, okay? Now, I could, I could sit him on the chair and, and like cause him to look at the computer screen, and I could do it every day for five years straight, and my friends, he's never gonna get it, okay? <laughs> he's not gonna understand, oh, there's information here, you know, Chesterton, like there's info, you know what that is, and that goes and talks to another box somewhere else, you know, you know how that works. And his, his is gonna be white noise in his doggy brain. He's like, dude, I can't even, I can barely think in the abstract at all and he asked me to understand the internet. And it doesn't matter how long I try to patiently teach him, he can't understand it because he doesn't have the hardware. His brain was not built with the components that cause a creature to understand the internet because my ways are higher than his ways and my thoughts are higher than his thoughts. And God says that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I don't know why humans have such a hard time with this sometimes. We can see that there's lots of other creatures on the planet, and we know that, oh, dude, we just have a higher brain. We can understand things they can't. And yet we don't think through the idea that, well, of course, God just thinks on a whole different level than us. He has the capacity to understand things just like Chesterton. My friend, you'll never understand. God would have to build entire new wings in your brain for you to even have the hardware to understand some of those things. So some of the reasons he doesn't give us all the details is because you couldn't understand it if you tried. I think another reason, potentially, is because um, we just couldn't handle all that information at the same time. It'd just be overload. We'd just blow up. Like, we'd be either so afraid of what we know is now coming, or we'd be so joyous and ecstatic of what we know is coming. Like, our little bodies just couldn't handle it. Perhaps we might be um, tempted to misuse that information, right? Like, come on, dude. If you had all the information of the entire plan for your life, you know you'd try to, like, sell it somehow. You'd try to make money off that thing, dude, right? It'd be like Marty McFly in Back to the Future 2. You'd try to find a way to, like, I know there's money in this thing now that I have all this information. And God doesn't want to bend our hearts in that greedy angle, so he doesn't. But I think the primary reason that God does not give us all the details is because he wants us to learn to trust him. See, God's always been about relationship. It's always on the basis of trust. God knows, hey man, if you have no unanswered questions, you don't have to trust anything because you're just trusting the information. You're trusting the data. So he says, I'm gonna leave some parts out. 
so that you have to lean on me relationally so you grow closer to me and so you know my heart better. Acts 1, 7, Jesus talks to the disciples and says it this way. You don't, you don't get to know the time. Timing is the Father's business. Here's number three. God is never in a hurry and he's never late. He's never in a hurry. Oh my gosh. He's clearly never in a hurry. But the good news is he's never late. See, God sees time in a very different way than you and I see time. God sees the past, present, and future all at the same time. That's how powerful his mind is. Let me give you an example. Here we've got a snow globe. Let's pretend that this snow globe is reality and life as you know it. And it also represents, like if we could put a, put a, put a piece of tape on the bottom of this snow globe and kind of walk in the middle and put little dashes on it, it would, each one of those dashes would re represent moments in history, time going by as you walk from your right to the left across the snow globe. These are different centuries in time. Now God is so powerful that he could go inside the snow globe to any one of those moments in time and inhabit it fully. See, he's so big, he can fill every moment with his presence. But he's also God. So he can be on the outside of the very snow globe that he created, and he can be on the inside at the same time. So you and I are limited. We couldn't do that. We can only go to one of those moments at one time. Even if I could get some pin particles and shrink down like Ant-Man, and I could go in there with some scuba gear and I could land on one of those little dashes on the timeline, I'd be like, I am now in this moment. I'm so finite that I can't be on the outside of the snow globe at the same time, but God can. That's why God can say, look, dude, I see past, present, and future all at the same time. I made the thing, but I'm not bound by the thing. See, God didn't make a prison around himself. He just made the thing and put all of us in it and invented time and invented how all it works, but he's still apart from it, but he loves you and I so much that he comes and enters into it to be with us moment by moment. That's why when you are talking to the Holy Spirit, it's like he's talking to you right now because he is talking to you right now. And he's on the outside of time at the same time. How many think God is really, really big? Now, this is why God never gets stressed out about your problems. Because he looks at the whole snow globe and he's like, oh, dude, it's good. It all works out just fine. You're gonna be fine. I've, I, I see what happens. Not only do I see what happens to you, I see what happens to everything. I know exactly how it's always gonna go. God's always insanely confident in himself. He knows exactly what's gonna happen. You ever been to a movie with somebody and they already know what happens? Like they've seen it and you're getting nervous. You're like, ah, but you glance over at them and they're totally chill because they know what happens. You don't know what happens, so you're freaked out. That's why God says, hey man, I know what happens, so trust me. You're gonna think that I'm late. You're gonna, you're gonna be like, God, oh, come on now. The, the time's running out. What, what, what are you gonna do? And God's like, um, no, I'm not late. I'm not in a hurry. It'll all be fine. This is why Peter said, a thousand years is like a day, and a day is like a thousand years to God. And what he's saying there is, hey man, the rules that you have with regard to time, God doesn't have those. God is not bound by anything like that. So for God, um, don't think about it the way you think about humans. God, unlike us, is really into the slow and the small and the obscure. Church father Tertullian, he said it this way, it is God's nature to be patient. And that's really bad news for us. Because <laughs> our nature is to be the opposite of that. It's the man, I want it now, let's go, let's make it happen. I don't know if you've noticed this before, but in the uh, stories of Jesus' birth in the New Testament, Jesus is really being contrasted to King Herod. He's the earthly king. He's really the false king. But he's the king that is full of pomp. He's full of like, get it done. He's fast. He's doing stuff that's grand and mighty and everybody can see, can see it. He builds entire cities. He builds this outrageous temple like none that's ever been built before. He builds his own palace, and they say it was 22 stories high. Herod's the guy that, man, he makes things happen. He represents like all of our desire to push it, push it, make it, do it now. And then you look at Jesus, and he's miles away in this obscure little town, Bethlehem, being born where no one's going to know. No one's going to shout at the truck, any trumpets. Because God does things slowly. And patiently. Just think about the way God has worked throughout history. Okay, he starts with this man named Abraham. 
is, well, Abraham, you know, Tom's gonna go by and I'm ultimately gonna raise up from you a great nation out of whom I'm gonna bring this Messiah who's gonna bless all the nations of the earth and save them from their sins, but it's gonna take forever. And so then he goes through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then finally they go into Egypt and they're there for 400 years. And then they come out and there's the time of the judges and there's the time of the kings and then there's the exile and then finally we get to Mary is pregnant with Jesus, but even then, God doesn't speed anything up. He still takes all nine months, right? And then Jesus, like he doesn't get any warp zone to like adulthood, he, like he goes through and he's a boy and he learns how to read and how to worship and how to pray and he's watching his friends grow up and maybe some of them are going off to Rome and you know, Rome is like everything's happening at Rome. Rome is the center of the universe. Rome is, you know, building coliseums and taking over entire nations and Rome is everything contrasted with Jesus who is hidden and quiet and slow. But Jesus was right on time. It was the right time. And just like we can trust God to bring Jesus at the right time, we can trust him to do the right things at the right time in our lives. Here's number four. God's timing is not always convenient. True. God's timing is not always convenient. Just look at this story for a second. Who is going to believe Mary and Joseph. So wait a minute, you've never had sex, and the baby is God's? Um, I don't, that's going to be hard to swallow. And then there's this census that they have to now like up and go to. Okay, so just imagine if our government just said, okay, you have a month, and you have to travel back to the place that you were born, and you have to register there. You can't email anybody. You have to literally like, get in some vehicle and go there. Can you imagine the crowds? Can you imagine, dude, every plane's going to be full. Every highway's going to be packed. Every train's going to be filled up because people are oh, scattering and getting, trying to get everywhere. So that's what they're doing. And I don't know if you noticed this, but mamas who have been pregnant, I mean, are you going to want to be on a donkey the week before you give a birth to a baby and this you know it was 70 miles but honey it wasn't in an uber you know what i'm saying she's on the back of this donkey and it's up over rocks and across rivers and it's gonna be hard stuff and not only that it comes up right to the point where it's not like she gets to bethlehem and has two weeks to kind of chill out at the spa like she's rolling in the very night this baby is supposed to come that's really inconvenient isn't it there's not even time to get ready and check it out her mom's not with her. There's no sisters with her. There's no midwife with her. It is essentially this young girl giving birth to this baby herself. There's no doctor. And she gets Joseph, and I don't have any, I don't have any idea that he knows what he's doing. Right? I mean, and, and not to mention, they've never been intimate. So this is like a, a great introduction. Like, hey, well, here's everything, you know. <laughs> what are we saying? And, and it's from, you know, cows. So they're, they're your chorus of help. What are we saying? Dude, I would think if this is the prophesied Messiah, um, can't you like prep a little better than this? God says, no. Following God's will and God's timing is often inconvenient. It's often very, very hard. But at least they didn't, um, they didn't complain too much, or at least it wasn't recorded. But here's number five. At the right time, God can do anything instantly. At the right time, God can do anything instantly. It's good for us to know that God can do in one second what it would take you and I years and years and years to do. Like we can really, really be trying with all of our fleshy power and God is like, well, yeah, I'm not doing it yet. And then bam, he just does it. He just decides to. Now, I know God uses human systems, he uses humans, he uses processes, he uses structures all the time to bring about stuff. God has plans over centuries like God uses human events and all that kind of works through that. But let's not fool ourselves and think that God needs that. Like God does, that's his normal way. But then he also gives, all right, I'm just doing this. This is done. Like you can just have money show up at the house. You can just get delivered out of this thing. You have no idea how that happened. Here's what I know about Joseph. He's looking at Mary and he's looking at this pregnant girl. And he's like, here's all I know. I had nothing to do with this. Every cool thing that Jesus ever does from here on out, Joseph's like, what, not me. Okay, God did not use the normal human way. God just did it himself. He decided it's time, now's the time for me to send my son into the world. And so it's just going to happen. So you can't stop God. That's why we get nervous. And we're like, God, um, come on now, let's go. Because I'm looking for the patterns. I'm like, well, I would think if you're gonna do this by this time, you would have done this by this time and maybe done this by this time. Lord, you are behind. 
You're behind schedule, Lord. And the Lord's like, ah, those rules don't apply to me. You don't need to worry about that. You don't need to think about that. See, when I'm ready, when I'm ready to do it, you're gonna find out, boom, I just do it. I don't need your permission. I don't need your plan. I don't need to do it the way you would do it. I'm just going to do it. I'm so glad he's that big of a God. So why are there delays? Why does it seem like it takes forever sometimes? Why are we going through this tension? I think one of the reasons is to test our faith. And the other reason is to build our character. See, here's what God knows. He knows that even though we get really impressed with one another's accomplishments and all the things that we try to do, God knows at the end of the day, you're not taking any of those accomplishments with you into heaven. The only thing you're taking is your character and the fruit that you've sent on ahead, bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. That's all. That's the only thing you're bringing. And sometimes we're like, um, God, I'm waiting on you. And he's like, actually, I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you to prioritize spiritual growth. I'm waiting for you to prioritize character development. You keep trying to go around that. You keep trying to like skip that step. And that's actually the fastest way to get where you're trying to get. So what do we do, like Mary and Joseph, when we just don't understand God's timing? We do what they did. First, we fear not. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. They fear not. This is the King James way of saying, don't be afraid. That's what the angel said to both of them. Do you remember? He said it to Mary, don't be afraid, Mary. And then he said it again to Joseph. And I gotta believe that wasn't just about don't be afraid of me, but don't be afraid with regard to all that's gonna come and the things that you don't understand, why you had to travel like that and why there weren't doctors at the you know, barn and why. When there's a lot of why questions, God says, I need you to not be afraid. I need you to trust that I really do know what I'm doing because fear is the opposite of trust. The more you trust God, the less you're gonna be afraid. And the more you're afraid, the less you're going to trust God. Now, sometimes we just try to confess it, man, I'm just gonna not be afraid. I just, I'm not gonna be afraid as though saying I'm not afraid is going to solve it. It's really not saying that you're gonna be afraid that makes you not afraid. What was it that made Mary and Joseph not afraid? They weren't just like reciting something. They weren't reciting, I am not afraid. They had encountered God. They'd been in the presence of the angel representing God. They'd had an experience where they're like, I know we're covered. That dude was really powerful. That dude was really strong. I'm not just trusting in, well, I hope I'm okay. I trust because of who I was with. This is why, my friends, it's so important. If we want to have less anxiety in our lives over the next year, we need to be around the pursuit of God's presence more. That's why some of us need to be in church. That's like, like you need a spiritual family, not, be, not to fulfill some obligation as much as you need a spiritual family to remind you of what's true, to help you close the distance between you and God. Fear is the opposite of faith. What did Jesus say to his disciples, Mark 5, 36? Don't be afraid, just trust me. Here's something that you can do every day. You can do this starting today or starting tomorrow. Um, think about this verse, Psalm 69, 13. But as for me, I will pray to you, Lord, answer me. Sorry, um, Psalm 31, 31 first. Psalm 31, 14. But as for me, I trust you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hands. That's a powerful prayer. My times are in your hands. That means I come to the Lord and I say, Lord, I got this agenda and I put it in your hands. I got these things I have to get done by here, but my times are in your hands. I got these people I'm supposed to meet with, but my times are in your hands. I'm letting go and I surrender the whole thing to you. And I trust that at the right time, you're gonna make happen whatever has to happen. Let's go to number two. So first was fear not. Number two is keep going. We gotta keep going at some point. We're gonna wanna give up just like maybe Mary and Joseph did. And we can decide I'm gonna keep going. That means we have to wait. Now waiting, we sometimes think like, well, it's cool to wait as long as you can complain about it. But that's not, that's not good waiting. <laughs> See, really, patience is waiting with a good attitude. It's deciding, you know, I, I just trust him. And if you really trust him, then it doesn't matter when he does it. It doesn't matter how long it takes because we trust that he's really going to do it. Are you tempted to give up on a dream? Maybe on a kid? Maybe on yourself? Here's what God says, Galatians 6, 9. So let us not become tired of doing good, for if we do not give up, 
The time will come. Somebody say the time will come. The time will come when we will reap the harvest. And here's the final thing that they did. They said yes to God's purpose. They said yes to God's purpose. Now, Mary literally said it a little bit later on in the narrative. She said, Lord, okay, that's great news. Be it done unto me according to your will. Joseph said yes in the sense that he didn't say no. Like they both didn't resist it. They're like, hey man, we don't get it, but okay. I'm gonna say yes to your purpose. We have to say yes to the entire purpose. Sometimes we're like, I'll say yes to the things that I want. And God says, some of the things that you want are part of my purpose, but I have a super purpose. It is my purpose to actually help that happen, make that happen at at a certain time. But then I have an overarching purpose. God has a super purpose. He has the ultimate purpose that he's trying to do, and it's the purpose of Christmas. It's, It's in the very text we started in, Galatians 4, Four, but when the time was right, somebody say when the time was right. God sent his son and a woman gave birth to him. His son obeyed the law, really important. His son obeyed the law so he could set us free from the law and we could become God's children. Don't miss the progression there. His son obeyed the law. That means Jesus grew up and obeyed every single command of God, even though you and I could never do that. He was able to do it and he did that. Why? So we could be set free from the law, why? Okay, some, somehow we need to be set free from the law because what? Because it causes us to now be able to embrace being God's child. There's a transfer, I'm not just his servant, I'm not just his creature, there's a familiar tra- familial transaction that takes place. Now, I have the status and the warmth and the welcome of family, not just creaturehood. What does that mean that Jesus obeyed the law so we could be freed from the law? Here's what you gotta know about the law. When we say law, We mean not only the Old Testament law, but the rules that we give ourselves or one another. If I keep all these rules, then God is pleased with me, then I'm okay, then I'm good. And Jesus says, that's a bad deal. I need to free you from that because you're never gonna be good enough. Because the law can't help you, it can only condemn you. Let me say that again. The law can't really help you, it can only condemn you. That was the problem with the law, that's why we needed grace. I'll give you an example. Let's say that you decide on your way home from Christmas Eve at Torch of Faith, you're gonna speed and you're gonna go 40 miles over the limit, okay? And you're gonna be pulled over and you're gonna get a ticket and you're like, oh, officer, what's the problem? Well, you were going 40 over and the law is if you do that, you get a ticket, congratulations, here is your ticket. Now, when you go to court and stand before the judge, okay, you shouldn't appeal to the law. He might give you mercy, but you shouldn't say, you know, you shouldn't give me this ticket, judge, because there's a lot of other times I was doing the speed limit. He's be like, you're not getting the ticket for the times you did obey the law. You're getting a ticket for the time you didn't. But what you could do is if the judge was being friendly, he could say, tell you what, I'm just gonna pay your fine. So we can appeal to grace, but we can't appeal to the law. The law cannot help you. We can't work harder and hope that kind of works off some kind of a debt. Only Jesus says, I'm gonna come up, I'm gonna bear under the law for you, I'm gonna take it for you, I'm just gonna take it. And then I'm gonna be the very judge that pays all your debts. So now the law's done, we finished with the law, and now you can just relate to God as father. Now you can be his family member. You no longer have to worry, "Am am I doing it enough? Jesus did it enough, it was enough. Now, obedience, it doesn't mean it's totally insignificant. We do obedience in order to train our hearts to be like God. That's the workout. That's how we become more like Jesus. It's just a really poor way to be right with God. That's not how we're right with God. We're only right with God by receiving his grace. What do we do? We let Jesus transform our relationship to the law so we can transform our relationship with God and now make it relational. That's why Jesus obeyed every day of his life and why he died on the cross and that's why it counted for you. What a great and awesome savior. Let me say it one more way because maybe you'll understand it better this way. There's never been a Christmas morning in my whole life where my kids came tumbling down the stairs and said, where's all the presents that we earned? Because I'd be like, there aren't any. There are no presents that you've earned. The only presents that there are are the ones that we're just giving you because we love you and on the basis of our relationship. If you want to do stuff to to earn stuff, well, that's called a job, okay? So you can go get a job, but that's different than me giving you this gift. Mercy 
is a gift. The friendship and the love of God is a gift. It's not something that we earn. That's why Jesus says, I don't want you to be stuck to the law. I want you to be free of it so you can love like a true child, living on the basis of love instead of works. What does that mean? It means we not only put our time in God's hands, we put our sin in God's hands. And that's the problem we can't solve. That's, that's the thing we need him for. I, I can't do anything about these debts, so I need you to do something about them, King, King Jesus. And I trust you. My times are in your hands. My sin is in your hands. And my eternity is not in my hands. It's in your hands. So here's the question. On Christmas Eve, can you trust, can you believe, can you think it's possible that the Lord, even outside of the snow globe of your life, he knew on this very day that you would be in this church and he knew that I would read this scripture to you. This is Acts 3.19. It says, now it's time to change your ways, turn to face God. So he can what? So he can be angry with you? No, so he can wipe away your sins and pour out showers of blessing to refresh you and send you the Messiah he prepared for you, namely Jesus. Hey, are you experiencing times of refreshing? Are you experiencing refreshment and joy because of your nearness and relationship to God? Or do you just, you know, you're, you're cool with God and you believe in God, but you're not necessarily relating to God in a way that you're feeling his smile and feeling his warmth and feeling his closeness? Because that's, that's what the scripture clearly wants. Here's, here's all I would tell you. You won't get times of refreshing from knowing everything about God's will. You won't get it by having all your questions answered. You'll only get it by turning to God and saying, Lord, cleanse me of all my sin, all my guilt. I'm not gonna pay these tickets. I need you to pay them. I just need you to bring me up and put me on your knee and hold me close for all that you've done. So here's what I wanna do on Christmas Eve. I wanna ask everybody in the room to bow your head, close your eyes. Anybody watching online, you can do this right where you are. Bow your head and close your eyes and we're gonna walk through this process together. I want you to imagine Jesus out there in front of you. And he's smiling, of course. He's not mad at you. He's looking at you and his arms are open wide. And he says, now is the time to come to me. Are you feeling distant? Turn to me now. My arms are wide open. My love is so deep for you. I'll never reject you. I'll never push you away. Don't listen to those other voices that say you need to pay for something or you need to do better. You need to be perfect. Those are lies. Come to me now. I want to make you not just my creature. I want you to be my child. I want you to relate to me that way. I want you to say yes to God's entire purpose, not just your purposes, but God's purpose for not only your life, but how he wants to use you. And some of us are like, I don't even know that God, does he really even have a purpose for me? Does he even have a plan? He does. Here's the thing. You can't see the plan without being in relationship. That's the only way that you can see it. Will you say yes to God's purpose? Now's the time, and here's what I wanna do. As some of you are, you're even, I know that you're sensing, you feel that God's even talking to you right now. This has been for you. You didn't expect it. You didn't come here thinking that, but this is for you. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'm gonna pray a prayer and that's gonna be you and I running to Jesus. And we're gonna throw our arms around us and he's gonna lift you up strong and he's gonna say, I'm never letting go. You are mine. I died for you. It wasn't in vain. I died to bring you to myself so you didn't have to live under the tyranny of the law. You just come as you are. And if you want to do that, if you want to run to him this morning, I want you to pray this prayer in your heart with me right now. Let's do it. Father, today's the day that I run to Jesus. I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to do anything in my own power. I trust your timing. I trust your purpose. I haven't trust you for my eternity. Father, any sin in my life, I turn from it now and I turn to you and I pray and believe for times of refreshment. I believe that you died on the cross and that your blood paid for my sin and I believe you think it was worth it. And I thank you now. Would you fill me with your Holy Spirit? Help me to walk all the days of my life with you and I'm gonna trust 
that just like my times are in your hands, my eternity is in your hands. And you're gonna be faithful to bring me to heaven. Lord, I don't just believe, I trust. I don't just believe, I trust. Thank you, Jesus. Now with every eye closed and every head still bowed, here's what I wanna ask you to do. For some of us, you've had a version of religion, but you've never prayed like that. You've never put your faith in relationship with Jesus. For you, I wanna ask you to do something brave for me. I'm gonna to count to three in a minute and I want you to put up your hand. No one else is gonna be looking, but I want you to look at me. I wanna affirm it. I wanna look you in the eye. I wanna say thank you. I wanna say amen. I want you to have this marker on Christmas Eve to look back to. Jesus died publicly for you. It was very public. I wanna ask you just between you and me, on the count of three, lift up your hand and look at me. Lift it up strong and tall. No one else is gonna look. Lock eyes with me on the count of three. One, two, three. Amen, I see you there, I see you there. Thank you, amen, amen, I see you back there. I see you, I see you, amen, amen. Thank you, amen. Jesus, we run home to you now. Keep putting them up if you want to. If you didn't do it yet, put it up. Amen, Jesus, we run home to you. We thank you. Your arms are open wide and you embrace us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hey God, it's up to you. We trust you to complete the good work that you started in us, in Jesus' name, amen. Hey friends, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time, here's what I wanna do. I wanna give you a gift. There's a little Christmas gift down here. You can see it right here. There's other ones right here. After the worship experience is over, why don't you come up and just grab one? It's got some resources for you. It's got some gifts for you. Um, just don't sell it on eBay, but go ahead and grab one of those and take it home. It'll get you started the right way. And let me just invite you. If you don't have a home church, we wanna be your people. This is hard to do. You need people to do it with. Here's the big vision, man. You need places to hear people speak truth and to love you. We're all just walking each other home. That's what we're doing. We need a family to do that. So you were invited to come be with us. Deal? Let's go ahead and worship God some more.